But if you think of what was going on in England in the 1830s, you do get a very interesting mix. I mean, England um, uh, abolished slavery in its own dominions in that period. And you also get a very interesting bunch of people at the colonial office, the office in Downing Street, actually, um, that ran colonial affairs and warfare around the, the world for Britain. Um, but the attitudes were strongly influenced by um, evangelical Christianity. And also they were looking at what they had done in, in other countries that they'd colonised. Um, as far as indigenous peoples went, it was not good. It's not a good scene. So they were actually committed to trying to do better in New Zealand. Maori were far more informed than we've ever given them credit for. Um, it's only when you think through the fact that uh, Hongi, that great war chief now from Napuhi, uh, went to Sydney in 1814 uh, to bring back missionaries um, and uh, did a selfie of himself, his own carved head, uh, while he was there. Um, went to England in 1820 along with the chief Waikato just to have a look at the place um, and to have, get, get some sort of feeling about what made this country the uh, strongest in the world, best naval power. Maori were already trading timber to build uh, ships and ships at that time took absolutely metres and metres and metres of wood and New Zealand had that wood. So, you know, there's a long-standing relationship of entrepreneurial trade and relationships between Maori and mainly British. Well, we always see him as behind the declaration, but I actually think he used an opportunity there um, that he'd been asked to create when he got the job of, of uh, in the Bay of Islands. And that was, how do you create a government that could be recognised as a government amongst Maori? Now, that's applying that British concept of what a government is, which we know now today. Too. But whereas if you look at the Maori world, you're really looking at what I'd call corporate governance, corporate ideas of many chiefs running a number of hapu and whanau and, and iwi. Um, and so they are more inclined to look at a shared kind of governing situation. That gets back to Maori tikanga and best ways of handling affairs. Coming up with looking at the changes, particularly up north in the Bay of Islands, I think it was not unusual for Māori to be very ready to uh, go put together a declaration of independence. And of course it was Henry Williams that put it in Māori. Um, it's uh, Busby that did the English uh, version. And I think you really need to look carefully at the Māori text too. The Māori text is much more affirmative and much more a concept that quite clearly is talking about an independent nation in its uh, infancy dealing with uh, big events that are happening and changes that are happening. Oh, I think they did. And that's why 1835 and their commitment to the Declaration of Independence was very interesting. I mean, their reasons for doing so were no doubt different from Busby's, and that's a, a very interesting example of where you've got to look at an event and the product that came out of it, the Declaration, from two points of view and start to understand its significance. And certainly the first stage of the Taraki report on Ngāpuhi in the north has made a very clear statement that Māori did not cede sovereignty. They uh, expected to have a sharing in the development and governing, governance of the country. I think if you start to look at the first 10 or 20 years of New Zealand, uh, it's probably true that Hobson really 
knew that he, he didn't have the power to control the whole of the country. He didn't have the resources. So, I mean, he was prepared from his instructions to give Māori um, that acknowledgement that they would continue to run their own affairs, but that he would set up a government, which they agreed to, to do something about controlling settlers coming in and the effect that they would have um, on Māori. I mean, sovereignty is a concept, and basically it means, in effect, it really is power on the ground, power to run affairs, power to make decisions. And uh, if you look at the both, uh, both treaty copies, the English and the Māori, you're really looking at a very interesting um, development, you could say, um, that Britain was engaged in, um, that it, New Zealand would be different from other countries, and indeed for a, quite a, a long while it was, and it is still. But there's still that tussle of conversation about going on, and, and Māori will continue to talk about it. We are very bad listeners. They say, look, you know, we have values and they're not coming through. We don't have a good run at the decision-making table. You know, listen to us, you know? So we need to be a little bit sharper with our ears and much more open to engagement. Usually I had derived, of course, from their whakapapa, from their uh, bloodlines, um, but also many of them were good leaders too. Uh, and we used to think there were only three. One of some of the first books that came out talked of three women signing, but uh, currently I'm running at about 12 to 15 women who signed, and there are probably ones that we still don't know because it's extremely hard to define whether this name is a woman or not. Um, when I started work on this about 30 years ago, I decided I'd write down every name of uh, people who'd signed. That's actually not as easy as it sounds, uh, because uh, they were being, the names were being written on soft paper or scraps of uh, paper that were made to, when they duplicated the original treaty copy. Um, and also, their, their spelling is a little different from what we do now. And in addition to that, you know, you also have great difficulty in knowing what hapu or iwi that some of them belong to. Some of the treaty, the nine treaty copies are very clear about what hapu, some are not. So I'm just now expanding that knowledge and information with the help of archives too. So there's a group of us working on it. And I would hope that uh, Māori of the future would uh, do more about developing the history of their whānau and hapu, and it's happening, so it's quite exciting. Well, we can whakapapa back because basically Hobson, as an early governor, represented the Crown, and now then we really need to think of what do we mean by the Crown, which we still have today. Well, if you understand how constitutions work and how they evolve, and also uh, understand the democratic principles that our country runs on, then I think you have to take a whakapapa of development from 1840, where you're talking about the Crown being literally Queen Victoria and the British government, because she wasn't, of course, a ruler in the total sense either. So the British government represented by Hobson is a beginning, um, but that colony of New Zealand became self-governing in 1852 under a new constitution then, um, and the Crown then started to evolve basically as a settler governing body. What do we have today? Well, we elect governments, and so they represent us, the people so that the Crown, in as much as it is the government and all the different um, 
threads of government in New Zealand. Um, they are our representative, they're yours, they're mine. So in a sense, the, when we talk about the Crown, we're really talking about the people of New Zealand. And so it's really important, I think, for us New Zealanders to get a grasp on um, the significance of that original understanding um, of 1840. It's, um, it gives us not only a right to feel good about it, it also opens up a huge sense of, sense of pride that this was a start that was going to be different. And indeed, it has been different. And Māori have continued to say, listen, it actually it would be better if it could be even better. So, you know, we're talking about an evolving understanding of this uh, conversation towards creating a new nation. And that's where I'm coming from in what I do. The settlement process is nearing completion on the historical claims, but the contemporary claims, which also have come through from time to time and the tribunal has heard, are clearly going to have to continue because if we're really committed to listening to a, uh, this conversation that Māori keep asking us to listen to, I mean, um, the tribunal serves a very interesting purpose of allowing people to express concern and what that concern is clearly given so that it gives the government an opportunity to listen. And I, I think um, although we, we have got a situation where the historical claims predictably are probably going to be resolved, the, we need to open up that bigger picture I think you can understand the present situation better if you understand the past. And uh, it's important that you understand the past well so that you can have a better role in supporting government and the steps that it's taking to reconcile um, the differences that we have had since pretty much since 1840. The legacy that's been left is for you and I too, not just Tangata Whenua. It's the legacy that you and I realise that most non-Māori don't understand their history. Indeed, quite a lot of Māori don't really fully grasp their history too. And I guess that will gradually be addressed in the schools and in writings, etc. People need to be engaged and tempted to find out more. A better New Zealand might be one where we um, understand the past better and therefore have a better grasp of what we're trying to do now. And I would really like to see a government that has a vision for where the country is going to go and one that acknowledges um, the need for ac accepting differences in the population and allowing for them. Um, and I guess that's where I'd like to see New Zealand going and also commitment from young people um, that they can make a difference, you know, and for them to be ready to make a difference in different ways. And for older people to realise that they have to give way. <laughs>